is the vaccine going to work? Is there a way of testing people on the door of a festival or of, of, of a venue? And then once you're in that room, you're in the bubble because you're tested. And that's how I think we're going to get back to it. Live music will never go away. It will never be repeated. It will never be replaced. All these things are good byproducts and all these camera angles and watching them on YouTube and whatever. But, but live music will always be number one and it will never go away. Let's hope so. I want to share a moment with one of you guys on the stage. Hi everyone, we're here at Point Black Music School in London. My name's Lee Erimez, I'm the Music Industry Management Programme Leader. And we're here today with Joel Stanley, Head of Production and Chief Executive Officer of Production Value, uh, his own company. We're here mainly to talk about the live industry, which at the moment is, um, from a music industry perspective, on the sort of tip of everybody's lips for certain reasons. I was going to see how long we can take before we say the C word. But I'm sure we'll get there. How are you? I'm good. I'm good, thank you. Good man. I thought if we could start the interview uh, with kind of a little bit of a history in regards to yourself. And I know, obviously, a little bit about yourself. Not giving my age away that I did teach you many years ago, which is terrible. Now you're going to hopefully give me a job. So, uh, yeah, you went to college, left at 18. It was a music performance course. And then for a couple of years, decided to work with local bands. And that's kind of where it started. So... Yeah, I mean, I'll probably backtrack a little bit just because I was working with bands kind of when I was already at college and they just kind of got a little bit bigger, you know, we're doing the pub circuit. I met you when I was, I think, 17, maybe 18. And then I was kind of doing the usual, you know, working three jobs, you know, pulling pints uh, in the day and doing gigs at night in the dog and whistle and the dog and trumpet, whatever it was. I was doing quite a lot of teaching. Uh, drum teaching. Teaching drums. Yeah. And then, you know, doing gigs at night or whatever. And then when I was 20, I got a call actually from David Coulter, who was at college with you and me. And, um, and he said, oh, I'm musical director for Damon Albarn. Can you come down and sort of audition slash play drums? So already at that point, by the way, it, there's a little bit of the sort of traditional who you know in the industry sort of thing happening. Yeah, for, and I'm sure we'll cover that many, many times. But yeah, so an old contact, you know, obviously we got on really well. I, I, I feel like I, I kind of left college with, you know, with my head held high and, you know, did well and got everything I wanted out of it. Met some really good people, yourself included. Uh, so I went down to do this audition for one of Damon's projects, one of his wacky projects. And I think I've told his story before, but actually one of the producers was trying to get this spreadsheet of you know, musical chords and how many lines in the verse and how many rotations of doing it. And they were trying to format this spreadsheet and they just said, you know, I was like, I was probably half everyone's age there. And Dave just said, Joel, can you just come and sort out the spreadsheet for Kate? And I said, yeah, yeah, sure. And it was sort of from there that it was a bit more of, okay, you've got to remember that it's not just about how good you are on the, on the chops. You've got to kind of remember that actually it's so much more than that. Oh, because this first job was drumming, right? This first job was oh, drumming, okay. right, right, right. but ended up kind of helping them, you know, format spreadsheets. And then, and that's where I met a guy called Craig Duffy, who's sort of been a mentor of mine for years. We ended up working together up until about two years ago. And he would just be like, look, can you just give me a hand putting out these chairs and I'll turn up early or whatever, you know, I was that, I was that geek. And, um, and it ended up being, you know, he would then call me and say, okay, that job's finished, but actually I've got a driving job for you. Or, or can you go on, he was working for um, Franz Ferdinand and he was like, can you go and pick up a passport from Glasgow and drop it off at Heathrow? Because he, I guess I just got that reputation of being a bit reliable. And it, and it turned out that, you know, my career kind of was, the drumming was sort of taking a bit of a sidestep and I was ending up doing kind of more and more of those sort of tour manager, split a driver, yeah. you know, do a bit of merch, bit of front of house, all that stuff. To sort of summarise that bit, Obviously, the networking, meeting people, the kind of the attitude, you know, say yes. Even if in your head you're going, I can't do that. But you go, yeah, yeah, of course I can. YouTube. Ah, yeah. Well, maybe not then, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So just going back a little bit then, I mean, was there anything in your education or like otherwise that made you think it's the live industry for me rather than any other of the sort of core industries? Yeah. And ironically, another contact from the, from the college, Tom, who was the technical manager, we were in a band together probably from about 17, 18. And we used to go to Birmingham Academy, you know, the old one on Dale End. Yeah. Mars Volta, Nine Inch Nails, Papa Roach, whoever it was, we would go and see gigs regularly because they're only sort of 
10, 15 The hummingbird, used to be the hummingbird, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. and I remember what I now know is, you know, changeover, but I didn't know then. I would just see these people picking up bass drums and moving them and packing them away side stage ready for the headliner. And then eventually we were the support band for whoever it was and we were the guys doing that. And obviously now I hire the guys that move the kick drums around. And I just had that, I kind of had that realization standing on the balcony at Birmingham Academy going, okay, as my career as a drummer isn't gonna be long unless I dedicate my, you know, every second of every day to it. And that's fine, but it doesn't leave you much scope. And I thought, you know what, on the side, I'll do some of that and I'll, you know, be a roadie or a local crew or whatever. And it was from there that I realized that actually my career as a drummer versus my career as a tour manager or a production manager or whatever it was, is going to be longer and more profitable and, you know, probably give me more opportunity. Yeah. And not that I don't regret not, not still doing the session stuff and playing in bands. You know, I used to love it. And obviously now we're, we're it's come full circle. Yeah, we're yeah. now in a band together. But th I knew that if I was, you know, reliable, sober, on time, I could, I could kind of work my way up. Or even one of those. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously, uh, like you're sort of saying, the, the drumming it took a bit of a sort of, you know, sidestep. Did you feel that at any points you could have still carried on with the drumming and, and sort of, you know, carried on getting your name about as a drummer? Because I think people that might think, from what you've said, you had to give the drums up. And obviously for a lot of people, it's like, you know, we talk about portfolio careers now because it's about, you know, doing as many things as you can. Yeah. Do you think you could have maintained the drumming as well as what you were doing? Being the workaholic that I am, I don't think I could. And, and I used to have this little calendar and it would be like, you know, my drumming gigs and my tour manager gigs. And it used to just be like, I remember for a year, I didn't have a day off. I was either on tour with the band or in the studio with, you know, Matt or whoever. And it was just, it just, it just kind of got to the point where I had to say, okay, I've got to dedicate my life to this to be the best at what I can. In the same way that if I was to be a drummer, I would have to give 110% to that. Yeah. And I just realized that I'm getting known now. People are calling me for to be a stage manager or a drum tech, not to be a drummer. And I just went, okay, I'm going to put the drumsticks aside for a bit. Um, okay, so just before we sort of move on to the production value sort of area. So in those first few years, if, if you were somebody you know, assuming that most people are watching this are either kind of, you know, just maybe starting to work in the live industry or thinking of doing it. What would you say in those sort of formative years are the most important things that you can think back on and think, you know, these were the key things that made people go, yes, get Joel to do it or, yeah, yeah. you know. Ironically, most of the gigs that I did for free ended up getting me the most paid work. And I know that sounds kind of, it's a bit of a juxtaposition. Seems to be but, a real theme, people but, saying, do it for free at first, maybe. I remember, you know, there was this one band called Sharks, and they had no money, and it was supporting Boy Kill Boy, and I had a contact through whoever, and it was just like, they just needed someone that could drive a car, not even a van, because they had no money. And I just went, you know what, I'll do it, whatever it was, 50 quid a day. And I called all my friends, you know, friends in Cardiff, friends in Birmingham, wherever it was, and I said, we're going to stay at your house, you know, can we... Not can we? Can we, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're, we're we going to stay at your house. And because I kind of grabbed it by the by the horns, and it was like, okay, cool, you're driving us, you're setting up all our gear, you're sorting out our accommodation. I was probably making them tea as well, and I saving kind of, them a lot of money and a lot of work. Yeah, and and from that, I obviously met the guys in Boy Kill Boy, and I think they maybe noticed, oh, you got that stage clear really quick. Actually, we're going to hire you, and you know, and it's yeah. that's not why I did it. That was just kind of how I was programmed. But it was just all those little, you know, you're only as good as your last gig. And obviously Sharks then disbanded and obviously now Boy Kill Boy did and you just keep, you know, the tour manager from that band or the venue guy from that that place. They all just remember you as that kind of, you've got a good attitude, workaholic, you know, nothing's a problem. Yeah, and probably like a lot of people, you know, particularly maybe with the live industry, you can learn a lot as you go, you know. Yes, you can go, you can say yes to things that you might think, oh, maybe I can't, yeah. but say yes, and you know, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. that's definitely an arena where you can do that. Yeah, so going back to your original question, I think, yeah, it's, it's doing stuff for free, because people will go, well, if you can do it for free, then you're obviously passionate about it, because if, without passion, there's just no point. You, you see these jaded old roadies, and it's, it's not fun to, to be around. Having a good attitude, I think that's kind of obvious. And just remembering every time you leave a venue, or a studio, or a college, or wherever it is, you know, shake someone's hand, remember their name, say thank you, you know, it's just all those little stupid things that you that you know, but you've got to kind of, you have to really reinstate yep. to yourself. I think that would be my advice. Okay, great. So uh, what, what happened in your head to go, 
in 2007, I'm going to start my own company. So if you tell us a bit about production value and the sort of early days of thinking about starting um, that. Yeah, so I needed a company because obviously f for tax reasons, I had a really good accountant and they gave me some really good advice. And obviously I met a whole load of freelancers on the journey up and they were all saying, you know, make sure you're good with your money and, you know, doing that. So a lot of it was for tax reasons. Having a brand, I think, is really important, you know, whether it's Joel Stanley, Lee Aramez, or whether it's production value in point blank, you know, there's always, you've always got to have a good brand, even if it is just your name. And I just thought sometimes it's good to just separate your name from the company, even though it's the same thing, essentially. You know, you, you don't ever really remember someone's name, you remember the company or you remember the logo, whatever it is. So it was a little bit of that. And just because I was doing more and more work and needed to have a bit of an infrastructure together. I had, you know, separate arms that I had a bit of a backline rental company. I had some splitter vans. I had to sort of compartmentalize my work as a as a touring roadie or as a, and as a freelancer. So at that point as well, were you starting to like have to bring other people in because you yeah, couldn't do it yourself? Exactly. I had to hire freelancers and I had to obviously, you know, make sure my invoicing was on point, and make sure my tax returns were on point. So yeah, I mean, that's the sort of boring side of the industry, but it's a lot of it was just logistical and, and uh, you know, bureaucratic, wasn't it? Yeah, but I suppose <laughs> from an official point of view, maybe that the perception it gives people, yeah. you know, production value. I mean, of course, yeah. now, you know, we'll obviously get on to talk about um, where production value is now, as in pre-COVID, yeah. post-COVID, because yeah. I think you have to you do that. Uh, you have to do a shot. How many minutes before COVID. I said it? Yeah. Do it or just blank it out. Um, yeah, buzz it out. So uh, what would you say then, say from, not so much before you started production value, but so seven, uh, 2007, yeah. 13 years, what would you say are the kind of, so without talking about Brexit or COVID, what have been the biggest changes that you've seen in general across the live industry? The first one I would, I can really think of is video because I was really fortunate enough to come into the industry at the point where video had just become this really heavy, expensive thing to what it is now, where you can kind of pick it up with your little finger. Now you can rig, you know, 70 metre, 100 metre wide. You know, you see the U2 shows, you see the Roger Water shows. And you couldn't do that without going bankrupt 10, 15 years ago because the technology just shifted so quickly. The quality of it, the weight of it, the affordability of it. So all the shows I really started doing where before you'd have Queen with the big park hands and, you know, you'd have you know, just a, you know, maybe you when you were touring, it was, you probably wouldn't ever tour with a video wall. It would be a backdrop and some lights. And and I was really on the forefront of a video being, okay, this is the thing that people are going to bring into the shows. You've got some, you've got a spare 10 grand at the end of the budget. Okay, we're going to put video in for the London show. And now it's like, well, you can't really do a show without video, whether it's cameras or whether it's video content or, you know, with projection, LED. And, and that was the really exciting thing for me. And I remember... 2010, one of my first sort of big tours with Gorillaz. It was obviously, you know, they were they were doing holograms and they were doing- I was gonna say that was a really interactive thing anyway. Exactly, wasn't it? Yeah, and yeah. now you don't really think about it because, you know, every man and his dog's got, you know, you can turn up with a video projector and, and, and do a show now, even to, you know, 100 people. Although you're saying that, obviously you're talking about sort of the world that you live in. We wouldn't need all those screens and video stuff if we were playing the stag across the road. You instance. wouldn't, but believe it or not, people do it now. You know, they actually, you know, they bring, big shows into small venues now. And I think that's really exciting. Um, so that's that was my biggest kind of change that I've seen in the industry. Things like, you know, people touring with Dropbox and Master Tour and all those sort of bits of technology, which again, I know 10, 15 years ago isn't that long ago, but you know, you probably have paper day sheets when you're touring with snuff, right? Under the hotel door. Yes. You know, I'm not calling you old, but yeah. I'm just saying that it was a, it was a different time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, well, then, although it's interesting you lo rely on the technology, you know, you assume touring with adults means you're touring with adults and sometimes you might be touring with children. Yeah. Oh, I forgot to charge my phone. So there's, there's always yeah. going to be... I don't roam when I'm in France. Yeah, or whatever yeah, yeah. it might be. So, yeah. But yeah, so there's the technology. I know it's all sort of related, you know, video technology. There's the whole kind of virtual reality thing, the augmented reality yeah. thing, which is obviously big without mentioning the C word. You know, now everyone's doing streaming. I know we'll come onto that in a bit there's a big movement in virtual reality, whether it's Katy Perry doing Jimmy Fallon, or whether it's the show we did with Dave at the Brit Awards with the, you know, the piano that, 
you know, the 3D piano effect. Yeah. Yes, it was coming to the forefront maybe a year or two ago, but really since we've all been locked into our houses yeah. and can't get on planes. I mean, we could sit here for hours, I suppose, and talk about COVID. You'd suggest there's nothing good about it, but what I think is when your you know, hand is forced to do something, obviously sometimes a lot of opportunities or creative you know, ways of doing things come out of it that you may not have gone, oh, we've got to invest all this money, you know, you might go, yeah, let's do it gradually. And I guess that's what you're saying with the streaming. I mean, the streaming thing was my next question. Yeah, it's, if, sort of, it's both related, I think. You know? Yeah, uh, as you said, streaming was a thing before COVID. Do you think in the same way that, you know, I suppose people have been watching, you know, football on uh, satellite, sky, whatever, for sort of 25 years, and it didn't stop people going to matches, which I think was the worry, you know, no, you can't have all these games on all the time because people stop going. So do you think that people would stop going to live shows if just everybody was streaming? Not in as, a million as a, years. No. No. I mean, I'm a massive Formula One fan and every weekend I'm watching it. And okay, you don't get the atmosphere, but sport, I mean, I'm not a football fan, but I imagine people will watch football whether it's on the couch or whether they go to the stadium. Same with Formula One, same with any kind of type of sport. With music, yeah, you can watch it on YouTube and, you know, I watched you know, the Taylor Swift show on Netflix last year, whatever it is, but you will never ever capture the the energy in that in that in the dog and trumpet or in Emirates Stadium. Whatever it is, you will never ever be able to recreate that. You but, can download music illegally, but you will never be able to forge a show and yeah. get that energy in the room. But it's weird because um one one person that I do follow just because I think he's always been sort of ahead of the, the you know curve a bit. Frank Carter and the Rattlesnakes. Yep. So if you see what he's doing at the moment, obviously ATC have got this, you know, streaming thing on the go. And it just seems that as, a, as an artist and a band, they're trying to capture as much of that thing as you can. So, you know, he's always like sort of dived, dove into the crowd. He becomes a part of the audience, all that sort of stuff. And I think, you know, of course, it's going to be hard to try and capture that with streaming. But you can see with this thing that they've got coming up at Brixton, they've made as much effort as possible to make that as immersive. Yeah. And of course, I suppose, going back to when you were saying about, you know, the VR side of it, where might we be in 10, 15 years? You know, we probably both think people won't stop going to gigs, but will it be probably hand in hand now that when you set up gigs above a certain size, there will always be now this, the option, you know, to, I, I want to sit my, uh, you know, at home with my thing in here, with Frank Carter jumping around in my, you know, head sort of thing? Yes and no. I think, you know, in the same way that if you can't get a ticket to Coachella, you can watch it on your TV. But I think if someone had the option to be there, they would be there. It's kind of like uh, the next best thing. The whole VR headset thing, obviously I've done loads and loads of work with, with one particular company in London that does that. You know, they set up these GoPros on pods and you can do a 360 view. You will still, it's still interesting to, to be able to choose your camera angle, but it's, it's still never going to be the same. The thing that I want to see is I want to see the Foo Fighters in a rehearsal room in a garage playing music. I don't want to see a band on stage without an audience because the whole point about a stage is it's designed to have an audience. I want to see where you couldn't normally see them, like a rehearsal room or in the studio or, you know, you know the, the kind of the documentaries you see of bands on YouTube, which you yeah. do watch because you can't be there. I'm not really... Now, maybe it's just me being cynical, but I don't really want to see a band on stage mm. playing to an empty room. I want to see them playing to a, their, themselves. Yeah, but it's weird, isn't it? Because, I mean, you know, everyone I speak to at the moment, so one of my colleagues who's a DJ, she started using Twitch. That's been really successful for her. Yeah. You know, you mentioned the Foo Fighters. I suppose there's been this sort of um, gradual move from maybe psychologically, the audience, What's the difference between watching, because you said the Foo Fighters in a rehearsal room and there was that gig that they did, I think, in their rehearsal room, which you watch it, it's like, well, it would have looked exactly the same if it had been live, but I know it's pre-recorded. Yeah. But Dave's still jumping around like a nutter yeah. and it still looks great. So it's like, oh, there's that thing on YouTube, I'll go and watch it. What's the psychology behind going, that's happening now, so I absolutely either have to watch it or... I absolutely have to buy a ticket. Yeah. You know, what? what's the sort of difference, do you think? <laughs> if you're in a different country, th you know, th that's a given. I mean, we've done loads of live streams and nine times out of 10, things go wrong on stage. So pre-recorded always wins because you can <laughs> you can say, okay, well, we can pre-record it. So if something goes wrong, you can overdub it. Mm. And that's why your Taylor Swift, your Beyonce, those Netflix shows do so well because they can edit them together. 
rough and ready is good, but I actually don't think there's a there's a there's a price that anyone would pay over ten pounds to see something that's live right now. Yeah. Unless it's a one off experience. Every band is gonna tour. If it's Adele's last gig she will ever play in the world Maybe you would stream. You would you would want to tune into that. But it's it's weird, isn't it? Because I guess when we talk about you know markets, genres, and et cetera, et cetera, sizes of gigs, you know, I saw the last Mr. Bungle concert in London nearly twenty years ago, uh, or it might have been twenty years ago. You were five. I was five. Really? Yes. They've just done a live thing, and I paid twenty dollars for it because it was like, there's no way I'm not going to watch it. No. You know, and I knew they were going to take it off for ages, and of course they're probably going to put it out again later. So. How many uh, times you watched it? Uh, just the one. Uh, <laughs> I rest my case. Yeah, yeah, but, you know, yeah, yeah. But, it, it's, but I suppose from a business perspective, this might open up stuff that people didn't think of until they've done it, i.e. businesses, whether it's people that have the equipment, whether it's labels going into partnerships with live people to go, let's you know bring a blah, 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 where you get a free whatever with the album if you stream, all that sort of stuff. So uh, Yes, I think the reason Glastonbury Red Button does so well on the BBC is because people see the audience reacting to the band and the band reacting to the audience and that's why watching Coldplay 10 years ago will always be an interesting show because there's a you can see the chemistry and the energy in the room watching them play I'm probably not going to watch them play on an empty pyramid stage because that would just be weird do you know what I mean and yeah, I yeah, think yeah. that's where streaming will come full circle and we were, do, we were doing so well it's now just a case of is the vaccine going to work is there a way of testing people on the door of a festival or of, of, of a venue. And then once you're in that room, you're in the bubble because you're tested. And that's how I think we're gonna get back to it. Live music will never go away. It will never be repeated. It will never be replaced. All these things are good byproducts and all these camera angles and watching them on YouTube and whatever. But, but live music will always be number one and it will never go away. Let's hope so. Uh, yeah, and that's my opinion. So I might as well throw in the COVID question then because I was gonna try and save it to last. So the current, mm. I think you've talked about the current, I guess, and a bit of the past. I'm assuming it's there's not, you know, uh, it's not just about sort of uh, streaming is going to take place of normal gigs because of COVID. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of other stuff, and I guess you've been at the at the sort of front of having to respond. You know, you've got a company, you spend most of your life on the road, and suddenly that stops overnight. So, sort of the, the you know the current because of COVID and the future. What do you sort of see are going to be the biggest challenges and sort of changes to the live industry? I've, had, I've done quite a bit of COVID training because obviously we've had to do live streams. We've, I've produced a couple of short films during, during lockdown and music videos and whatever. And it's actually kind of made me a lot more aware of the possibilities that's out there. It's made me realise that things are possible to do safely. It's also made me realise that we're creatures of habit and we will, you know, you say, wear a mask, you say wear a hard hat and people forget and people slip into their old ways because that's just what they're used to. So I think there will, in two years or a year or two, I think we'll get to a point where we all know the protocol and the etiquette, but not everyone will follow it. You know, in the same way that if you're walking around a venue and there's riggers in the roof, sometimes I'll forget to put my hard hat on. It's not because I don't care about my life or the others around me, it's just because we're busy, and we're just going about our day and sometimes you just walk out to the floor and you go, oh, I forgot to put my mask on or whatever it is. Hmm. I think we'll see technology improving in terms of test, you know, whether it's you getting on a plane or whether it's you going to see your favorite band. I think you know, we'll go from 45 minute test or one hour test to kind of instant results. And I think it will, I think we'll slip into a, into a habit, you know, we, you think about seatbelts, you know, there was an uproar when seatbelts came in. Or not smoking in or not smoking all that venues. stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah. And 10 years down the line, you think if someone smokes indoors, you kind of, you really take a step back because it's such an alien smell. Yeah. And I think it, will, it won't be a new normal, it will just be the normal. You know, it's such a weird expression there. Mm. Um, I think my thing was, you know, particularly because I look after a band, they're, they're all, like everything that we do, in regards to sort of management stuff, it's all filtered towards getting out on the road. So yeah. that's one big problem. Yeah. And that getting out on the road normally involves, you know, anything between 100 to say two, 300 people crammed in, sweating, jumping over each other, you know, yeah. punk, hardcore metal, that sort of thing. So you could see, you know, obviously there's been stuff, whether it's, um, you know, Nick Cave doing the thing at Ali Pali, I think, with the piano yeah. on his own, yeah. you know, uh, uh, Frank Turner, did the socially distanced gig. I think he was one of the sort of early, you know, people to try it out. I could see how 
for certain you know genres that might work but i think for a lot of other types of artists dj's clubs all that sort of yeah. stuff you can't say here's a here's a two meter square can you stand in there please no. and don't touch somebody no. next to you so we yeah we've got to get to the point where once you're in the door you're safe and then you can do what you want and and i think the whole you know now you mentioned about getting in a mosh pit and we all think oh that sounds weird but we used to do it in the same way that i used to fill up my car with a petrol pump and i didn't think about who touched it before me we just become a little bit... Yeah, you can't do it with your elbows. We, we, we've kind of become a little bit um, desynthesized, I think, to it all, or mm. maybe the opposite. And eventually we'll go, do you know what? I haven't got time to put gloves on. I'm just going to do it. And you go, well, I did it 10 years ago. I did it a year ago. There's no difference, you know, mm. in the same way that flu's around or whatever it is. It's, it will just become... We'll just live with it. Yeah, yeah. Or it will be eradicated one way or the other. Cool. But yeah, I think... I, I mean, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but we will, we will get back to it. It will just have to will have to get to a place where it's possible. And that means technology and money and investment and you know, whether you walk through a, a thing and it sprays you with disinfectant or whatever, you know. <laughs> a car wash. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. In so who knows what it is, but someone will come up with something and make a lot of money and we'll get back to it. So let's have a pact, no more COVID talk. Yes. No more C words. Right, last question. Um, what are the sort of main considerations? And I guess this is, you know, because at Point Blank, uh, you know, there's music production students. Within that, some of them are going to be DJs, some of them are going to be sound engineers, some of them have got skills which they can transfer into lots of other areas of the industry, which they might not know yet. Yeah. There's the music industry management courses. In my sort of experience, a lot of people that may not have thought they wanted to work in the music industry in the live sector, you know, will put a gig on and I'll go, you're an agent, you're a promoter, you're this, you're that and they find that probably the most exciting part of the experience of studying on a course like I run. Yeah. Um, so then they go, but what, sh you know, what do I need to do? What shall I do first? You know, how do I become a promoter, a booking agent, or whatever else it is? What would you sort of say to people that either absolutely are thinking the live air industry is for me, and if we can, I'm not gonna say the C word. If we can just imagine- Life is normal. Life is normal. What, what would be the biggest considerations that you would say to anybody um, if they're thinking, right, I want to work in the life sector, and what, what are the key roles, really briefly, and how w would you say to them, this is what you should do at first? Well, firstly, I'd say 100% do it, because it's the best industry, as I'm sure you'd agree, in the world, and doing all the, the you know, the, the modules I've been doing for you, every single Zoom call at the end, you know, I say, what's your advice? And they all just say, it's the best industry in the world, it's full of great people, yeah, there are hard moments and, you know, we all graft and we work long hours, but it, but it genuinely is. It's addictive and it's, it's a sexy industry. People want to be in it and, and, and it's, I would 100% encourage anyone wanting to do it to do it. In terms of the key roles, live, obviously there's, my, uh, you know, I'm a production manager and I love doing it, but I've had to learn every single one of the other jobs that I work with to understand how to do my job. So I did audio back in the day, I did a bit of lighting, a bit of backline, a bit of stage management, drove vehicles, all those things are now roles that I, I'm in charge of now. So I have to know if the truck driver needs an eight hour rest, it's not because he's lazy, it's because the law states that he needs an eight hour rest for every 24 hours or, or whatever it is. So do as many things as you can to understand each role. It's going off topic. I became a better car driver when I learned how to ride a bike because you become aware of your surroundings in the same way that you'll become a better drum tech if you... You mean motorbike, not a little... Yeah, yeah. Um, you'll become a better stage manager if you understand what the, the backline guys need. If you've done backline, you'll understand what the stage manager needs. You know, and, it, and it's about learning. It's not just about putting your blinkers on and going, I'm going to be the best guitar tech in the world. It's about going, actually, what does the tour manager need? What does the artist need? What does the production manager need? What does the manager need? You know, mm. what do the fans need? Or whatever it is. And if you can just think a little bit more outside of your own role and your own two lanes, I think that will help everyone. Um, do you have much to do with promoters and agents or not so yeah, much? Yeah, massively. You know, we have, to, we have to look at the routing and we have to look at the settlement. We have to look at the budget. We have to look at who pays for what. Um, so that was all money, 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 money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but but also where does the barricade go? The promoter has to have an opinion because he wants to sell, or he sh he or she wants to sell more tickets. Um, but also, the manager has to have an opinion because they don't want the fans getting too close to the artists or whatever it is. You know, so there's every single conversation needs four or five different people sign off. You know, um, and then going to your your other question, which is kind of the sort of diversifying. You know. 
I've done C-word training, I've done health and safety training, I've learned how to drive a forklift. All those things you could relate to event management, to working in a restaurant, to working in an Amazon warehouse, whatever it is, all those things. If you learn to be a great warehouse manager, you'll also know how to then run a tour or learn how, how the trucks go in order or whatever it is, you know, everything is relatable. So if you're doing a side job, um, I know a few, few of my friends are, you know, doing some courier driving, you know, you need to understand schedules. The mm. parcels need to be dropped off by this time in the same respect that you know that the lighting has to be delivered to the stage before the audio does. So just know? a lot of organisation and project management and all yeah. that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Does that, does that Yeah, yeah, and actually, and I'm assuming that you come across artists as well, artists and their entourage. So, you know, for those people watching who actually they just want to be the person up there performing, yep. you know, uh, particularly so if they're studying at the moment and, you know, they might be on the sort of cusp of, you know, doing something, touring and yeah. whatever. What's your relationship like, you know, so the creators, artists, performers, and then, you know, if I can just call you crew. Yep. Uh, you know, I used to work in that area a little bit, and I guess sometimes it could be quite an interesting relationship. So do you generally, you know, is it a positive? It varies thing? tour to tour and artist to artist. Some some tours, you know, the management and the artist just keep the artist away from you, and you have to go through three levels to get an answer, whether it's yes or no, or do they like the design or whatever. But some of them, you'll sit down in a room with them like this and go, okay, here's the show, these are the venues we're playing, you know, this is the design that we've come up with or whatever it is and you actually have a conversation you say you know five minutes to go on stage or whatever it is and others the tour manager takes care of that and you go through them it, it really does depend on the artist that's me done all the questions so just wanted to say obviously thanks for coming in my pleasure fingers crossed we're looking at a slightly brighter future maybe post christmas and uh you'll see yourself back out on the road 100 percent Thanks for watching everybody. If you want to know more about Point Blank Music School and the programmes that we run here, then uh, check out pointblankmusicschool.com. Massive thanks, Joel Stanley, for coming in. Pleasure. All the best in the future with the live industry and hope to see you on the road 100%. at some point.